Well, hey there. How you doing today? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me today. Glad that you're here. Well, the question before us is a very interesting idea. Did Herr Professor Einstein actually anticipate the idea of exotic extraterrestrial propulsion systems? Uh, and I think if we look at the historical record, the answer is clear that he did. And this is uh, new information that I've come upon recently, uh, uh, looking into the history of physics and Einstein and some of the other really uh, founding fathers of physics from the early 1900s. Uh, a lot of them had ideas that you and I never heard about. Uh, not the ideas that they're most famous for, but ideas about cosmology, about gravity, laws of large numbers. Uh, this applies to Paul Dirac and Ernst Mach, the Austrian uh, philosopher, physicist, and uh, Schrodinger and uh, Einstein himself. Uh, I've talked a lot on this channel about different ways that so-called paranormal phenomena could actually be present in our reality. And I've spent a lot of time talking about Hugh Everett's ideas about what's called the many interacting worlds idea, uh, the idea that there are parallel realities, and the newer idea that some physicists have been creating. So initially from the 50s, we had Hugh Everett with the many worlds interpretation, the relativistic states idea, which is what he called it. Uh, the idea that at every sort of nanosecond reality is splitting into many alternative possibilities. But you and I are just in one particular one at a time, this version of us. So we only see this version of reality. We don't see the other ones. And the other ones never interact with us again. At least that's the way Hugh Everett formulated it in 1957. But a newer idea is the many interacting worlds model, which we've talked about, which is the idea uh, that not only can you get rid of the idea of any wave collapse, there are no disappearing worlds. You don't have this uh, wave function that collapses just to one observation the way Copenhagen suggested it to us. Um, but that all the realities exist simultaneously and their interaction, not only uh, do they not collapse into nothing, they're all there, but their interaction between parallel realities creates quantum mechanics, which is a really mind-blowing idea in and of itself. The idea that you do have a quantum wave function, but that's the effect of the interaction of lots of parallel Realities. This is something I got into the other day on the, the MUFON podcast with Richard Beckwith uh, on YouTube. And so that's sort of one idea of the way that other phenomena could interact with our reality, could sort of pop in from other realities. There's actually a real scientific theory that says that this is now possible. Even the creators of the Many Interacting Worlds model, uh, Howard Weissman, has said in interviews that it's really not their place to say exactly what these other phenomena might look like, these other uh, realities, just that they, they would exist. And some of them could be like ours and a lot of them could be very different. And they could intrude or interact, involve themselves in our reality in some way uh, through this many interacting worlds model. I think that's quite a statement for physicists to make. Uh, that this could now be possible. And you think of all the phenomena we talk about on this channel, you know, UFOs and strange electromagnetic phenomena, balls of light, resonant viewing, picking up distant information. You can see how the idea of uh, parallel realities would matter to that. But there's another way that these phenomena could be in our reality and yet hidden without even resorting to the idea of parallel realities. And this came up uh, at the 2018 IRVA SSC meeting in Las Vegas, where uh, Dr. Hal Putoff brought up his blue shifting idea to explain how these materials work that have been recovered from crashed UFOs and UAPs. And he showed us this bismuth magnesium sample. If you'll remember, I did a video about it. You can look at it here to see my summary of what he presented to us. And actually, you can watch Hal's uh, video too about it also the original lecture. But basically he suggested the idea that if you 
beam terahertz uh, radiation into these uh, bi-level materials, these kind of sandwiched together materials, which he said are, uh, there's no known technique to actually make them on Earth the way we actually see them in these samples. And they're type of nanotechnology that has to be manufactured in zero G and the isotopes don't even, the isotopic ratios don't fit what we find with our bismuth magnesium here on, on Earth. But in any case, the idea that he suggested there is that these materials are a type of uh, space-time metric engineering, that if you actually modulate these materials with a radio wave in a certain way, that it would change some of the fundamental constants of physics, mainly uh, permissivity and permittivity, the two uh, constants that determine the speed of light. And if you'll remember from that video, I'm sure you'll remember this, is that uh, epsilon permissivity times mu equals one over C squared. So if you change permittivity, which is the electrical uh, coupling of a particular material and the magnetic uh, properties of that material, if you alter those, you actually alter the speed of light. Uh, so basically the idea is that these extraterrestrials, the people that are working with ma these materials, obviously this is like really highly classified stuff or we'd know a lot more about it. I mean, Hal only showed us one type of material. I'm sure there are many more. There's gotta be lots of different types of materials out there uh, that these craft could be made from. If we look at some of the Valet Nolan research, there's a slide presentation they did in, I think, in, Paris a couple of years ago that's online. There's lots of materials that are being examined. These are metamaterials that are extremely thin. And again, the people I've talked to say they can't be manufactured here on Earth. So the idea is they work by interacting directly with the quantum field by altering their electrical and magnetic fundamental potentials. And that changes what they perceive as the speed of light relative to us. So their speed of light would be different in the craft than our speed of light that we normally perceive. And that would explain, as Hal said in the lecture, uh, and explaining the summary why a lot of these UFOs appear to be very bluish and very bright, is because their speed of light now is a little different than ours because they've used these uh, metamaterials to change the epsilon and mu components. So their speed of light is different, so we're slightly slowed down. And what they perceive as normal, normal reality, we would appear to them slightly red-shifted, they appear to us slightly blue-shifted. Well, at the time I thought, man, that is a really interesting idea. Who came up with that? Well, it turns out that Albert Einstein himself considered a variable speed of light way back in 1907. This is part of the forgotten history of physics. And as I said at the beginning of this presentation, a lot of those, and they were mostly guys back then in, in physics, uh, a lot of those people back then who founded physics as we know it had alternative ideas that we've never heard about because as Alexander Unziker has described, I'll put one of his videos here, a uh, scientist from Germany, there's a retrospective narrative and we're only seeing the endpoint from the point of view of the people telling the story. But these physicists had other ideas that were dismissed. Paul Dirac's idea, the law of large numbers about ratios, very fundamental constants, the ratio of the width of a proton to the width of the universe turned out to be a certain number, 10 to the 40th power. And the strength of the electrical field to the gravitational field is also 10 to the 40th, and Dirac was really interested in this. Well, people at the time dismissed this as all those guys are just dabbling with numerology. But it turns out that the variable speed of light that Einstein was looking into, he was going to incorporate in his general theory of relativity. We only got the version of physics where light is at a fixed speed because Einstein was dealing with gravity as a product of curved space-time. But where you could imagine that space-time is flat, then light would take the quickest possible route and it would be curved. And then hence you'd have a variable speed of light. Now the reason this idea didn't go much farther is that Einstein made an error. Because C, the speed of light, equals frequency by wavelength. And at the time 
time itself was measured speed of light with clocks. So they weren't looking at wavelength. They were just looking at frequency, according to Alexander Unziger. And so they, and you can see this in the early papers that Einstein wrote, 1907, 1911. He was looking at a verbal speed of light. When they did the computations, uh, looking at the gravitational potential of the universe as they understood it at the time, and light, it, it was off by a, a factor, a certain uh, factor of around 0.87. And they couldn't quite figure this out. And again, uh, even when Einstein was working with other physicists on this, they made the same mistake. And so he sort of abandoned the idea of the variable speed of light. And it wasn't until Robert Dickey, the American astrophysicist, corrected this error in, I believe, 1957, that they found out that Einstein hadn't looked at the entire, uh, you know, equation for C equals wavelength times frequency. He was just looking at frequency. So if you had corrected for the error, the variable speed of light would have been something that was incorporated with physics. And uh, you have to remember, at the time that Einstein was working with these ideas, there were no other galaxies uh, known outside of the Milky Way. The, the idea of galaxies didn't exist. It wasn't until Edwin Hubble discovered other galaxies in the 1930s. It was 20 years later. So at the time, it was just these stars here, and that was thought to be the entire universe. So Einstein wasn't able to incorporate the entire mass of the universe to get the correct answer for how the variable speed of light would relate to gravity. But the main point here is you can see that you often think, you know, are these ideas totally new? You know, this Hal put off blue shifting idea with the, the UFO, UAP materials, how it works. Well, it turns out that other physicists, Albert Einstein, they were looking into the idea of the variable speed of light as a direct function of, as we said in the beginning, epsilon and mu. And so the variable speed of light would suggest if other civilizations have figured this out, even civilizations here on Earth, we might not even perceive them anymore. And that's really the implication of all this is besides parallel realities as a source for some of these really interesting phenomena that we study here interacting with us, even within our own reality, not resorting to parallel realities, but even in our own world, you could have entities operating at other frequencies. at slightly different frequencies. If the frequency was just changed a little bit, they would appear blue shifted, as many UFOs do, and they could give you a uh, actual burn, as we found out from uh, Gary, who we've interviewed on this channel, the former missile security guard from Minot in the 1970s, who said, you know, it's such a bright bluish object, and he was burned on the right side as his colleague in, in the truck at the time the uh, from the security alert team that they were part of. So we can kind of see the evidence sort of fits this idea. And if you kept shifting these fundamental constants enough, the speed of light would change so much for the occupants in these vehicles, they might actually disappear. They might be invisible to us. They might have a cloaking capability. So perhaps there's entities amongst us right now that we don't see, we don't even perceive because their speed of light is different than our speed of light. And it would also go a long way to explaining why all these UFOs and related phenomena, balls of light, Bigfoot, things like this, seem to affect people's cars, radios, and the like, and why electronics affected in such a strange way by being around these phenomena because they're electrical, they're magnetic, they're electromagnetic, and those fundamental constants are being altered by this type of technology. So anyway, those are my thoughts on this. And I think, again, it's really interesting that physicists were looking at these ideas, I think, in summation a long time ago. Uh, but for some reason, you know, slight mistakes were made at the time and it got pushed off to the side. We never heard about it in our formal idea of physics. Um, but I think it's very interesting that they thought about some of these ideas. They would have anticipated the way that we're coming to believe that some UFO craft operate. And I, I think that's really exciting because instead of facing the criticism that you've probably heard, there's no science behind this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, there is science behind it. And the physicists 100 years ago were already considering that physics, even if it didn't develop formally as much as the other theories that we know better, special theory of relativity, general theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, so forth, there were other parallel ideas that would have uh, explained these phenomena. 
this is just another way that we can say that these phenomena fit into science, science that we're developing, but obviously uh, had roots and beginnings a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> That's all I have to say about it. I know there was a lot, but thanks for watching. And uh, put your comments in the box below them, we think, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care for now, and bye.